Greetings, anime community and world at large. I've got some bad news for you. It turns out that you've all been asleep for two decades now and nobody told you, but don't worry. I'm here today with the help of a sponsor to give you a G-fueled wake-up call. Fifteen-ish minutes from now, your pace is gonna be racing like you just imbibed their delicious new Tetris Blast flavor, and you will feel a powerful urge to both watch Metabots and use the promo code BASEMENT to get 30% off a G-Fuel order of any size. First, though, it's time for a bit of tragic backstory. Pokemon hit the same year I entered elementary school, and by the time I graduated, Pokemania was in full swing, with dozens upon dozens of collecting and battling RPGs, card games, and top building kits competing for my attention and my parents' cash, each with their own accompanying anime, of course, and their own tribe of kids who would defend them to the death. There were Pokemon kids, Yu-Gi-Oh kids, Beyblade kids who mostly grew up to be mechanics, an oppressed underclass of Digimon kids, later Battle Network and Bakugan kids joined the fun, but never in my young life did I meet another Metabots kid. A lot of that has to do with how the series was marketed and distributed over here, how little and late a presence it had in toy and game aisles around its release, despite being based on some solid Game Boy RPGs from Natsume. It also probably didn't help that the show poked fun at Pokemon and its content Contemporaries, a parody that I personally appreciated. This is an extremely funny anime, but in retrospect, spoofing more popular things only created similar optics to the Duel Masters dub, which gave off the lowest of low-rent clone vibes. But if kids back then had actually given it a chance, I know that now Metabots would be one of the most fondly remembered and talked about anime of its era, chilling with Cowboy Bebop and Evangelion in the anime GOAT pantheon. Because while Pokemon's action looked like this, and Digimon's looked like this, Metabots Monroe Battle Till you drop Sorry, I uh, tend to get carried away when I hear that. It's just so awesome as is that animation. Even in the first episode, Pepper Cat's moving around like a Pikachu on G Fuel, and Metabots doesn't limit that kinetic energy to its action scenes. Dialogue is frequently punctuated by wildly expressive, fluidly animated body language and extreme, eye-catching shot compositions that use exaggerated perspective to give even static scenes a feeling of dynamic depth. The same easy-to-draw character designs that made the show feel a bit cheap and cartoony in promo art also allowed it to come alive with animation that holds up better today than any of its more poster-friendly contemporaries. It would take Pokemon's animators a decade and a half to catch up to it, not just in terms of style, but also the clever story structure of mixing fights with slice-of-life comedy. Though if Sun and Moon is Hamtaro, then Metabots is more like Crayon Shin-chan, or South Park for kids if you're normal. And even more than Sun and Moon does at times, these blobby, angular, malleable designs, coupled with flat, bright colors, thick black shading, snappy animation timing, and a penchant for weird camera angles, make Metabots feel almost like a trigger anime out of time. Which isn't just a coincidence. Records of anime production back then are a bit incomplete, especially in English, but episode 14 of Metabots appears to be the first thing Kill la Kill and Gurren Lagann's Hiroyuki Imaishi ever directed on his own. And while that episode is even triggerier than the rest of the series, my man even gave Brass the Battle Toaster an ass, 
It wouldn't shock me to learn that he did uncredited key animation work on other episodes. Either way, he's far from the only Gainax talent on the show. Masahiko Otsuka, the assistant director of the Ava movies, plus a lot of Ava episodes, directed episode 6. Tadashi Hiramatsu, Shoji Saeki, Kazuhiro Takamura, and Masayuki, one of Hideaki Anno's closest collaborators, all contributed storyboards to the show. A lot of Gainax animators worked on Imaishi's specific episode, too. Plus, the entire series was produced by Kenji Horikawa, former production manager on Evangelion and co-founder of Metabots' studio, B-Train, which was envisioned as a training ground for young animators and would go on to develop Spider Riders and Dot Hack, among other things. You might also know him presently as the founder and president of PA Works, which is one of the few kyoani class studios out there today that still makes mostly cool, original shows and movies. Also Glasslip. Nobody's perfect. Now, we don't usually credit that much to producers, but Horikawa is a man who knows people, and a lot of the people he knows end up working on his shows. Like Tensai Okamura, who came on to direct Metabots after storyboarding for Evangelion and Bebop, and would springboard from this directorial debut into helming, among other things, Wolf's Reign and the first seasons of Blue Exorcist and Seven Deadly Sins. Not to mention, he created World Conquest's Vesda plot, and this other little anime you might have heard of called Darker Than Black? We're still just at the tip of this iceberg, by the way. There are few anime in existence period, let alone kids' anime from this period, in which you'll find a denser concentration of truly legendary animation talent, past and present, than Metabots. Counted among its key animators, storyboarders, and episode directors are Eden of the East creator and standalone complex director Kenji Kamiyama, Princess Principal and Tokyo Magnitude 8.0 director Masaki Tachibana, Promised Neverland and Sound of the Sky director Mamoru Kanbe, Toshiyuki Inoue, assistant director on every Satoshi Kon project, Sword of the Stranger and O oh Maidens in Your Savage Season director Masahiro Ando, Eccentric Family director Masayuki Yoshihara, Little Witch Academia director Yo Yoshinari, and Masaki Yuasa, who I hope needs no introduction by this point. And that's still just a short list of the most historically visible animators on this series. Sakuga scholars will doubtless recognize countless other talented animators from its staff list, including Yutaka, half the best scenes in Hiroaka Nakamura, and the inventor of anime missile barrages himself, Ichiro Itano. There's also Tomonori Kogawa, an 80s veteran who's worked on everything from Negima to Legend of the Galactic Heroes, and on that note, I almost forgot Shinsuke Tada, director of the Galactic Heroes reboot and Kuroko no Basket. Also, Hirofumi Suzuki, character designer for Naruto and Boruto, did mechanical designs for this series, and... I need to stop myself there, because almost everyone who took a lead role on Metabots, most of the key animators, and even a lot of the in-betweeners, are whole anime history rabbit holes unto themselves. Seriously, just go to ANN or MAL, click any name on the staff list, and prepare to have your jaw fall off. It is wall-to-wall -wall legends. I need a G Fuel IV drip just to read through their collective credits. Unfortunately, most of that talent moved on before the second series, Damashi, or Metabot Spirits, which itself moved on to Production IG, so that continuation, which starts with episode 53 in English, is weaker by a wide margin. And that's not just limited to production values, sadly, as it also lost the screenwriting talents of Ryota Yamaguchi, who also worked on Cowboy Bebop, Escaflone, Great Teacher Onizuka, Seven several Ranma movies, and OG Hunter x Hunter. Reiko Yoshida, writer of k Violet Evergarden, and that one Digimon movie that Mamoru Hosoda keeps making, also penned a few episodes of the original series, and there I go again down those rabbit holes. 
I'm sorry, but I promise I'm not just doing it for the sake of listing cool people and shows. This concentration of talent all translates to one of the best anime viewing experiences I've ever had. And that's not just nostalgia talking. I've been re-watching Metabots with a couple of anime buds, neither of whom grew up on the series, and they're having even more of a blast than I am. As you'd expect if you know your Poke clones, the show's core premise is pretty simple, appealing, and easy to merchandise. In a world that looks an awful lot like 90s Japan, everyone and their dog has a fighting slash general purpose assistant robot called a Metabot, so named because their minds are contained within gold hexagonal computer chips called metals. The tin pet frame those metals fit into can be customized with a wide array of parts, legs can be swapped opt out for wheels or flotation devices, arms for rockets or swords, and any part can be put on the line at any time for keeps in a submission row battle. These betting matches are the main mode of action for most of the series, excluding a few tournament arcs and more dramatic encounters, and they're always overseen by Mr. Referee, an eldritch being who is always watching, always waiting for the moment a child challenges another child to a fight. No matter where they are, no matter how impossible it seems, he will appear and make it official. And like all good, inscrutable cosmic entities, Mr. Referee never gets old. Now, it should be noted that Everyone in Dogs does not initially include our hero, Icky Tenryo, whose economic circumstances mean he can only be an armchair metafighter, pissing off most of his classmates by saying he'd totally row battle better than any of them given the chance. The school's top metafighter and bully, Samantha, is particularly fond of picking on Icky, assisted by by Spike and Sloan, the two stooges who make up her gang. All that changes after Icky lucks his way into finding a medal on a random riverbank, where it was dropped the night prior by a mysterious and clumsy phantom thief, who stole it, you see, because it's a rare medal that possesses incredible hidden powers. We get our first glimpse of those powers when, desperate to save his only friend, intrepid junior high reporter Erika Amakaze from a wash up rock band who've taken to mugging children in a local park, he plugs that metal into the cheapest tin pet he can find at his local convenience store, and it awakens as Meta B. Dude, I rock. What you just heard there is the iconic performance of Joe Motiki, just one great part of what's low-key one of the best English dubs of its era, and I really can't emphasize enough how much that great voice acting enhances an already fantastically balanced cast of characters. The clashing egos of Icky and Metabi are a great source of organic conflict and comedy, the screws who flip between unjustified arrogance and deferential cowardice as soon as someone strikes stronger and meaner shows up, make fantastic minor antagonists, and Erica's kid reporter shtick makes a perfect excuse for them to quickly stick their noses into whatever weird episodic storyline is going on at the time. An early one of those takes them to a posh private school that just gets more and more obscenely ostentatious the further in they go, in a search for a legendary metafighter that ends with Iki finding both a new love interest in the kindly Karen and a proper rival in Koji, who strikes a great balance between being Gary Oak hateable and pushing Iki to be less of an egotistical dick. And they're just a couple of the show's fantastic recurring characters. The very first character we meet, Phantom Renegade, is a pretty obvious riff on Sailor Moon's Tuxedo Mask, but whereas that adult cosplay weirdo who gets way too friendly with middle school children is framed as an enigmatic badass, the Phantom is more of an incompetent doofus, who daylights as a 7-Eleven clerk. And and gets so little recognition for his phantom thievery that he has to gas his own alter ego up to the apathetic children visiting his store to buy toys who I'm pretty sure are his only friends. Opposite the Phantom, in a more unambiguous villain role, we also have the Rubber Robos, a gang of gimp-suited bozos whose schemes make Team Rocket look like proper baddies. They really want to be evil and take over the world and stuff, 
but it is abundantly clear that they don't have the faintest idea how to do it or what evil even means, really. The kids first run into them when they've fumbled their way onto a pile of metals by creating a scooby dooey urban legend about a metal-stealing ghost, entirely by accident, it should be noted, and it's pretty much just downhill from there as far as their plans go. At one point, they try to trick all the townspeople into accepting free absurdist home renovations so they can turn the whole city into an evil amusement park, which will help them take over the world by... uh... Part of their appeal is that they don't overstay their welcome. Instead of using them in every episode like some kind of crutch, Pokemon, Metabots frequently brings in other antagonists, like incredibly mean toddlers and an evil PTA, to keep our heroes on their toes. The Rubber Robos do become more prevalent as the plot goes on and stakes escalate, but that works surprisingly well because, through a hilarious plot mechanism that I won't spoil for you, they're actually capable of becoming serious threats when the story needs them to be without undermining the silly group dynamic that makes them so entertaining when it doesn't. While Metabots starts goofy and stays goofy throughout its 52 episode run, its characters grow and bond with each other through all that, especially Iki and Metabi, and as a viewer, you're gonna get attached along with them. And by the same token, I promise that you will appreciate it when the storyline eventually pays off all their intertwining arcs in a satisfying, action-packed climax. That's all still a ways off, though. At the start, you're just gonna be soaking in all the excellent jokes and incredible anime action, and marveling at how high above its weight class this weekly children's video game commercial punches. If I have your interest, and I know I do, you can find the first season of Metabots streaming free on Retro Crush TV, and both seasons are available on Standard Definition Blu-ray from Discotech Media. Now go get your friends and go watch it. Also, obviously, G Fuel is available at gfuel.com. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement. <laughs>